Monsieur Cobblestone, won't you please sit down? I believe you're a friend of Mrs. Shuttleworth's. Yes, it, it was Julia who told me to come and see you. Although, I have met you before, haven't I? Oh, of course. I didn't know. Oh, there's nothing for you to know. I was there at Mrs. Shuttleworth's insistence. That makes it more perplexing. <laughs> Although I don't want to waste your time. And I fear that you'll think I'm wasting it anyway. I'm sure that most people, when they come and see you, they're obviously ill and they have some reason for seeing you and I don't. I came out of desperation. And if you think I should leave, I won't be offended. Most patients begin, Miss Cobblestone, by telling me what they think is wrong with them. They're quite sure they've had a, a, a mental breakdown. And they're sure that someone else is to blame. But in general, we begin with the patient telling me what they think is wrong with them. Exactly what they think is wrong with them. And the nature of how that came to be. And then, the prologue to my treatment is to let them know that they're mistaken. What they think is wrong with them is actually not what's wrong with them at all. So with you, let's begin with the idea of normality. Okay. You said that there were two things. Yeah. Can you name one of them? An awareness of solitude. Oh. <laughs> that sounds so flat. I mean, it's not that there's been a crash, although there has been of sorts a crash. It's not like an illusion has been shattered or that I've been ditched. Although people get ditched all the time and they figure it out and work through it. Mm -hmm. But it's that I've realized that I'm completely alone. And it's not because a relationship ended or, or one that existed didn't actually exist at all. It's more that I know now that in the world we're just all alone. And it's my relationship with everybody. You know, it, it doesn't even seem logical to talk to anyone anymore. Mm. Mm -hmm. Do you talk to anyone? Yeah, too many people. Mm. I'm a perfectly well person and I could work if I thought that there was anything to work for. I, I mean, I don't have delusions. Except, of course, that I think that Everything in the world is a delusion. I should probably tell you the circumstances. I forget that you don't know anything about me. and I, I think I've been taking for granted the fact that everyone around me knows what's going on and I haven't had to explain myself the past couple of weeks. It's coming. <laughs> well, you can make me better. And I would do anything, I mean, anything you ask to get back to normality. Well, I don't talk to my parents. Mm -hmm. They don't really understand what's going on with me. I like to involve men in my issues, but I also keep them at a distance, I suppose. They don't need to know everything, right? I mean, I don't even know everything, so. I don't know. Well said. Julia, me, 
not parents, men. Okay. So, when you talk to Julia, without telling me anything that you share with Julia in confidence, okay. what's the nature of the feeling between the two of you? Do you feel you're wasting our time? Do you feel your friendship is growing deeper because of these sharing conversations? I mean, I don't think I'm wasting her time at all. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think she understands me. You know, if she understood me, then she would know I was wasting her time because what's going on with me is crazy. It's not normal. It's not something other people seem to be dealing with. But because she doesn't understand, it's you know, foul, right? She can just listen and, and nod and, and pour more champagne mm -hmm. and, and we can have mm -hmm. more elaborate parties and stupid library book club sessions and it'll be fine. But it doesn't make our relationship stronger or weaker. It's, it's not that at all. It's, it's more a sense of just offloading on someone and, and having a nod and wink every now and then. So, in Julia's failure to understand what you're talking about, what you mean, just wondering, in your mind, does that place her beneath you on a evolutionary scale? I think maybe she's just lived less. You know? Mm -hmm. Like maybe maybe I'm an old soul and mm -hmm. she's a younger soul or something. Because she's smart. It's just in a different way. So do you feel like any of these conclusions you've recently come to about aloneness and singular solitude, is there a spirituality to these findings? Is there something meta about them for you? No. Where do they lie? Where do they live, these ideas? Where do they come from and how do they affect you? Why do these thoughts come up in your head? What happens when they do? Well, usually they come to me when I'm on the train. Sometimes when I'm with other people and I don't want to talk to anyone and I say why. And and when they when they come, I mean I panic. What happens when you panic? I do my best to make sure no one notices and I get out of there as soon as I can. And if I'm lucky, I have a guy with me, and if I'm not, I'm not. What's lucky about having a guy with you? It's something about numbing the pain, really. Sex? Yeah, distraction. Comfort. Closeness. Mm. I mean, at least it. It helps me deal with my aloneness for a moment. In those moments, do you feel genuinely less alone? No judgments here. No. Okay. Do you have any ideas? <laughs> I have lots of ideas. Okay. All the time. <laughs> a good place to begin might be with whether there were any times where completely effortlessly which is to say through no huge action of your own 